<laughs> and wait and see. Just not right. I robbed his wife yesterday. She's taking one by city one on Are we? Waiting to go live. There you go. Asking ye shall receive. I know, right? That was such good timing. All right. Good evening, everyone. This is the January 26th Planning Commission public hearing. Can I start with roll call, please? Brian Swintek. AJ Summers. Rich Levy. Brian Adams. Lou Tatora. Before we begin agenda items this evening, is there anybody here who'd like to... Uh, speak public comment on something not on tonight's agenda. Seeing none, we'll go on to agenda item number one. This is uh, public hearings for decision by Planning Commission. This is PL 2022-0411, Airport Meadows Self Storage. Is the applicant here for a presentation? Hey, before they present, I need to uh, recuse myself from this. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Is this on? You can hear me. All right, good. Uh, my name is Eric Grippentrog. I'm with Landmark Consultants. Uh, see a couple of new faces here. I've spent a while since I presented, so I uh, want to let you know that I'm a, a professional engineer. Uh, I work with AJ. That's why he had to step down. Um, been in Steamboat for uh, close to 27 years, and um, been, I'm familiar with this project as well, this site. We looked at it uh, for people 15 years ago, um, and we uh, we understand too that there's been a, some public comment and uh, the, having it mainly to do with the slopes. And so I kind of want to just take a real quick, do you have a, uh, is there a laser pointer or anything like that? Right there on that switcher, I think that has one on it, I believe. Is that working? Yeah, it's working, all right, great. Um, just kind of want to just talk, briefly about the location of the site. And uh, as you guys can recognize this long uh, racetrack right there is the airport and uh, Elk River Road going on up. Uh, kind of an unfortunate uh, landmark is the uh, the funeral home right there. I always you know, hesitate to say, that's the funeral home, we're right behind it. But that's where we are. This used to be the butcher knife and is the distillery. Um, <clears throat> why don't you go ahead and do the next one, Matt? Just going to jump to the existing conditions. So the existing conditions on this project, and we're going to be talking about the preliminary plat next. Um, this is basically a two-step development process for, for those who haven't been through this before. We have to go through the formality of a subdivision because the property has never been previously subdivided. It was a meets and bounds. So we have to go through the preliminary plat process, which is next. And then the um, normally what we do is we go through that and then we go through the development plan talking about what you're going to do on the property. Uh, for this presentation, I know we're focused on the development plan, so I'll, I'll try to keep it on that. The uh, the project, and you can't really see it on this plan. I apologize when you're looking at a PDF and things, on, you know, when you see it up on the screen, it's a little bit harder to tell. Maybe the next screen would be a little bit better, Matt, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, so this, and these drawings are all in your packet too. So what you see in red 
are areas where the existing slope uh, is at or exceeds 30%. And that's part of one of the subdivision criteria for recognizing where those things happen. Uh, any other type of uh, landforms that might interfere with what might be considered uh, eligible for development. And this has gone on through throughout the different uh, areas within the Steamboat Springs. It's not unusual, or no, nor is it specific to this project. Um, you can see that the limits of this uh, these slopes, uh, kind of, if, if you would be able to overlay the, the site plan, you would notice that everything is working backwards from these the bottom of these slopes. And as you go over towards uh, you know, the adjacent properties, uh, lots one through seven, and again, where the funeral home is, uh, this is where the lawn ladies uh, landscaping business site is. Over here is where Butcher Knife used to be, and it's now the distillery, I think, is coming in. You can see how those slopes also kind of creep out towards those properties. And that's one of the, I think the, uh, you guys had in your packet a, a letter from an adjacent property owner who was concerned about some of the slopes and had some questions. Their property is right in this location right here. So again, what we did is we worked very carefully with NWCC to evaluate where there may be some slope instability. We've seen it on this site driving by, who hasn't seen things up uh, behind Copper Ridge in that area. We know that that's something that can happen even though the slopes aren't wicked steep. You know, they're kind of like this, but it seems like sometimes they just melt and ooze. And that's kind of what, the, what has happened over in these areas. So knowing that we set the limits of the project um, not only at the bottom of this slope, but we moved it inside. You want to go ahead and next slide, Matt? So that slope limit you saw is basically, and this is what the building envelope for the preliminary plat establishes, saying we don't want to go beyond those lines where that red on the previous slide was. And you can see how we've actually pulled things back even further uh, to make sure that we had some comfortable distance in there. We could make sure we have room for snow removal, snow storage. Uh, those type of activities, all of our drainage, so we wouldn't be doing anything up against the toe of that slope or anything that would, I guess, uh, encourage or invite any type of slope movement. Or if it did happen, for whatever reasons, it wouldn't be in an area that would uh, jeopardize the buildings. In other words, we have like a factor of safety on top of a factor of safety. The uh, airport, uh, the taxiway uh, is there our point of access through here. It's an existing platted right-of-way that dead ends. This is a built the road that uh, the funeral home used. They they built a little ways in and came into their site. Next to us is a proposed. It's an improved project. So what we did is we took the uh, uh, their their approved plan. It hasn't been built yet. Laid it into the site. Made sure that whatever we did worked with their access ways, their uh, their grades. And so we, even though it's not built, we fully accommodated it. And we come into our site and we have our storage unit buildings here. And I don't know, we do have Eric Smith here with the architecture, if, if you have any questions related to the buildings. Uh, but basically what we have are some wider areas for larger, if you, people want to do RVs, that type of storage for some of these buildings, we wanted to make sure we have enough space for maneuvering. Um, otherwise, this is uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. It's a uh, self-storage uh, site. Um, I guess that's that's it. That's pretty straightforward. We thought we did a very good job with the application and going through working with staff, answering any questions, and uh, try to nail it right out of the gate. Um, so if you have any questions, we'll be here. Uh, Jeremy, and I get you guys next for your presentation. Is that right? Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, just a brief summary to follow up on Eric's presentation, which I think was relatively uh, inclusive. Again, this is a development plan and conditional use for the site. Uh, as um, mentioned, uh, self-storage is a conditional use at this location. It's zoned industrial. It also has an airport overlay that were, was considered and enters into the conditions of approval you'll find. Also has a skyline overlay, um, which we did confirm through exhibits as well to make sure that we're in compliance with the skyline overlay. Um, the consistent character uh, we found in the area for this development, we found they minimize adverse impacts, adequate vehicular access, and all of the requirements of the CDC. Um, when we looked at the conditional use of this site and whether or not it was appropriate, 
Uh, we found it to be a relatively positive transition between the industrial uses to the south, the fact that it sits behind the airport and behind commercial fronting properties, and the residential district to the north, we actually found that a cell storage facility would be one of the more compatible industrial uses that could occur on this site um, next to or adjacent to a residential property. There was public comment as Eric addressed, and I'd like to take just a moment here to sort of flush through that. It is a bit confusing and hopefully I can um, enlighten you on that and answer any additional questions that come out of that. There's a grade and fill uh, open permit right now that is on a small piece of this site as well as other adjacent sites where that steep topography is that Eric pointed out to you. From previous activities and grading um, that caused a slope there that did fail. So there was uh, some open enforcement code compliance by Greg Yeager and our department. They have taken action against the party responsible for the failures of those slopes. Currently, there is an open grade and fill permit out there that continues through September of this coming year. So as far as we are concerned in the planning department and with engineering's consultation, um, I believe Emric's here as well to answer any more advanced questions you might have about that. Uh, but as far as we're concerned, while we know there is an existing problem, that problem is tied direct more directly to the individual um, with which the case of compliance is being held against and enforced. Because that's still taking place, they're still undergoing the repair of that slope. There's not really anything per our community development code that would prohibit us from continuing this development plan approval. Now, should they have been out of compliance if that uh, the permit was closed and they said, all right, you know, we're all done and we know it's not fixed, uh, then they would be out of compliance. But as far as we're concerned, they still have time to fix it. They're still in the process of fixing it. And it's sort of an independent open case that's occurring where that individual party is held responsible even though it's happening on this particular property uh, that is under development plan approval right now. So that's a little confusing. Please feel free to ask questions. And uh, again, we have Emmerich as a resource who is from our engineering department uh, to specifically um, help with that. That was our only public comment. Otherwise, uh, through planning and staff's review of this particular development plan, um, contingent on the obvious upcoming condition that the preliminary plat and final plat are approved. Planning department does recommend approval of this PL2022-0411 development plan for Airport Meadows self-storage facility. All right, thank you. Yeah, can <clears throat> maybe I have a quick follow-up on that yeah. public comment just because you were on that train of thought. Sure. Um, the individual who's responsible for that, is that the applicant? It is not. It didn't sound like it, but just to double check. Yeah. And then if that other person did not make good on their grade and fill permit, would that positively or negatively affect this application? Say, say that again, would it positively if, or? Yeah, how would it impact this development plan? Would it, would it even have any impact or would it be beneficial to this development plan if it didn't happen, say? No, I, I, the layout of this development versus where that grade and fill permit happening is of is inconsequential. I would say they're they're not developing on that steep slope that needs repaired. So there's I don't think there's any benefit or drawback to the applicant. The if it didn't happen, the enforcement would simply it would go back into reinforcement from our. Um, code compliance. And I think I it, believe it's a civil suit that's ongoing. Understood. Thank you.
Yeah. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, question, uh, I guess for the applicant. Um, my understanding, at least based on what was presented, what, what I've read is there's going to be lots of storage here. There's going to be lots of activity. And the access into this place is off the taxiway? Yes. Okay. And is that an active taxiway? No. It's, taxiway is the name of the right-of-way that was given to it, not the real oh, one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Was that what okay. you meant, Lou? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This just seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Well, I feel better about it now. <laughs> you have to get clearance from the tower before you access your storage oh, unit. <laughs> I can see the big RVs trying to pull in in the middle of the night while the planes are landing. <laughs> That's great. Any other questions? No. Yeah, I was going to follow up on your, Brian. Is So if this project goes to full development, does the, the fact that there's structures in full development there, does that preclude someone from getting in to be able to complete the, the safety project with the slope project. I don't know that I have the professional expertise whether to offer if it would in encroach on that right away or those repair activities. Um, I don't know how they're accessing it or what their plan is. And I guess the applicant could answer. I mean, if, if there was to be slope failure, would it affect this development at all? The slope failure, as I understand it, is failing away from the property to the downhill properties, those sort of, we'll call them the frontage parcels. Mm. Yeah, that's consistent. Yeah, that's, that's a, a real answer. So, I mean, the whole issue right here is the activity from those developments that are um, you know, I, and again, I don't know exactly who's involved or who the individual is, and I don't want to get into that. It's not in my business, I guess. Um, but the activity over there by the lawn lady site, over by the uh, by the butcher knife site, again, if if you think about this way, I mean, the slope is going to move if what's holding it up is removed, if that support. And so when those properties were developed and built upon, that material was carved out for their their use. That's when it moved. And so then if there's going to be some fixes, it's going to need to be from below to buttress or support or stabilize that. And so whether or not they'd use access right now, those are separate parcels. You know, they don't have an easement through this site. They don't have any legal access to use it. Um, I do know that the applicants are uh, pretty good guys, and I'm sure they'd be happy to work with people, but I, I can't speak for them on that. I don't even know what the proposed improvements are or what's required. Um, but it seems like they've got ample room. There's a huge green belt that exists behind lots one through three that's pretty large in nature that gives them access beyond the properties they own. So um, I would think they've got solutions at their disposal, but I don't know what they might be. But it's it's also, I mean, I think well, some of the questions too, it, that's in a different area of the site. The site's huge. It's an 11 acre site plus uh, 11 plus acre site. So there's lots of room to move, but those areas are not within the zone of anything we're talking about tonight. They're on the very tall, very uh, uh, tail end to the Southeast. You want to pull that back up? It's, again, I mean, we can. Yeah. Maybe if we pull up the visual, particularly the one with the red slopes will probably be the easiest way to describe. Unless you don't need it. I'll, I'll just do the site. Everybody. I'll just I point mean, to I, it again, Matt, the one with the aerial. <laughs> Uh, you have to share. <laughs> so this area over here, this is this is that green boat. You see that right there? So these are the lots, and they kind of extend down beyond down this area. The uh, the encroachment. This is all that we've seen when we were out there doing our, uh, all of our work and surveying. We noticed that there was a crack in the in the hillside right here, and it kind of this is the portion that it looks like it's clipping on our site. That little thing right there. This is the uh, the lawn lady site that I was mentioning. 
their slope goes out to right about here. And I think that that slope work that you saw as part of the permit extends all the way down in this area. So again, the portion that we observed on the property encroaching was right there, pretty minimal. And again, far away from everything that we're doing in the valley. Does that help? Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Just one thing to confirm. I think ultimately the public comment, the worry is that if we make a decision tonight that it would have an effect on closing out that open issue. So basically what I'm hearing you say is there really isn't a chance of that. It still needs to be closed out. If they aren't in compliance by September, they would then need to be chased again, right? So any decisions we make tonight wouldn't prevent that from being fixed. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. And the, the main, the variance on the preliminary plat is the usable lot area, right? Is why this is before us now. E yeah. Well, there, there will be in the preliminary. We're not plat, in the preliminary plat. Usable. Yeah. Should we're be. not there yet. <laughs> we'll be there in just a few moments. So, yeah. No questions. Then. Any other questions? And then this, if I think I understood the zoning map, this has nothing to do with entry corridor standards. Correct. Okay. Great. Uh, is there any public comments on this agenda item? Seeing none, unless you had any final follow-up applicants? No, thank you. Great, thanks. Or staff? Oh, no. Um, no final comment. Great, I'll close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. Um, now that the, uh, my concerns about the taxiway have disappeared, um, I'm going to like to make a motion to approve PL 20220411 with uh, the two conditions as shown. A motion. Do we have a second? Second. And second. Any other discussion? Uh, yeah, with the conditional use, I mean, we've been approving uh, storage units all along. At some point, I'd like to see a some inventory and some discussion of how we're impacting our industrial land by converting everything to uh, storage units. That's why it's a, one of the reasons it's a conditional use is to review these things. Um, but at this time, I have no data to say we have too many of them or not enough. And that's some, because that's all we see in the industrial zone right now is storage units. And it's, we always have this discussion about the loss of true industrial space. And it is a concern, but not a big enough concern at this time. I just second that. That was my concern as I was preparing for tonight as well. Um, I do, I do tend to agree with uh, uh, staff's assessment tonight on whether or not this was just a, a good use of this particular property anyway. Even if we we did have other issues, so I'll just that would be what I would add uh, to the motion. I think it's very approvable um, as presented. Uh, friendly is uh, we're supposed to be using a amended staff report with 11 conditions of approval for the development plan. Uh, yeah, that is correct. I apologize. For I that. forgot about that. Turn our rainbow back. It. Do you accept that friendly? Uh, yes. <laughs> Great. Any other discussion? Okay. In case I will call the question. Yes. 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 And then that passes unanimously. So then we'll jump on to agenda item number two, the preliminary plat for the same development, uh, public hearings for recommendation, PL 20220407. When you're ready for a presentation, if you have one. Good evening. My name is Eric Rippentraw with Landmark Consultants. Uh, we prepared the preliminary plat uh, to accompany the uh, development plan you just saw. Oh, Jeremy. Uh, this is a, a basically a formality to uh, create a, develop, a legal development parcel from a previously unplatted parcel. Uh, we pre we uh, prepared this and uh, the, uh, the, I'm just looking over here. <laughs> I apologize for stammering so much right now. I'm just waiting for the, uh, plan to come up. Basically, it's just one lot with a uh, a building envelope. And again, we just talked about how the building envelope was uh, developed using the setbacks where they applied and then focusing upon the uh, the toe of those uh, steeper slopes. 
Um, the usable lot area variance is uh, is kind of an unusual one in the sense that it's uh, you know we're trying to create basically a four over a four acre uh, building envelope, but because the property is so large, using the criteria, uh, either the property need to be smaller to uh, to to make the math work, um, or the development area bigger. But in this case, it is what it is. It's the the land that we've got and the uh, the slopes that are defining what is considered usable, and it just didn't fit in with the uh, the criteria in the code with the math. So we prepared that uh, that variance request, and uh, otherwise, I think we uh, we met or exceeded the re requirements described in the CDC. If there's any questions? I'll be here and let me know if you have any to it, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. The staff have a presentation as well. Sure. So obviously we're all very familiar with the project right now. Um, what we still, to remind you, it's zoned industrial. We also have airport overlay. We also have skyline uh, zoning in this district. The airport overlay does come into play. As you can see in the plat, we've created the um, avigation easement in the lower southeast corner. That is a condition of approval that weighs all the way through the development plan as part of our CDC. There is a, a bit of the confusion as um, Eric alluded to in the major variance that occurs on this site, uh, just to provide transparency to that. There's, this site is bifurcated by a steep slope, which means we can't really provide access to the upper portion without cutting into the hillside and, and creating roadways through areas that the CDC deems um, less desirable to develop from environmental perspectives and otherwise. So the variance for this is to realize that that piece up above is undevelopable or the best solution is to leave it undevelopable unless it were approachable from perhaps the airport in the future. We're not certain. There was discussion around whether or not the way that we could alternately bring it into a different level of compliance was with if the applicant decided to split the um, plat into two lots. Ultimately, we didn't want to create a lot that really couldn't be developed because we weren't providing access to it. So we sort of 50 cents or half dollar deciding that creating a lot that could be sold but not developed was worse than creating a lot that didn't meet our minimum lot development standards should the airport decide to purchase this or there were ways to make access to it in the future uh, we'd just go through an additional subdivision process. Uh, it is a bit confusing around the math to it all, but um, one of the key rationale besides, you know, creating a minimal developable lot, uh, particularly in the industrial zone, is to make sure that we have, you know, some minimum size. Obviously, the size of this is 4.2 contiguous acres, which we deem to be a reasonable industrial lot to be developed. Um, with that said, uh, barring the public comment from the previous about the slope failure, which is particular to this parcel as well, I believe it was sort of extended to both projects, but that has been uh, discussed. We could bring it up again for minutes if applicable. Otherwise, there was no public comment. Um, staff does recommend approval of this preliminary plat. All right, thanks very much. And the uh, updated staff report was only for the last one. You didn't have an updated staff report for this one, correct? That is correct. Okay. Questions from commissioners? I have a dumb question. Can you explain to me what you mean when you're talking about like plat and preliminary plat? Is that like you're saying where on the lot you're allowed to build? What does that mean? No. So the platting process basically uh, has to occur before anything can be developed on it. So we have, this is an unplatted parcel. 
the parcel exists, but it's not a developable lot until it has been platted. And it means it meets all of our community development code uh, standards to be a lot. We require various things like access, utility service, a minimum size. You can't plat a very small parcel that nobody can do anything with. Uh, so it's sort of the vetting process to bring land into the city development process um, in a way that we think will set future development up for success. Thanks. That makes sense. And I'll add on to it real briefly. So we have a preliminary plat process first. When we bring it in, there'll also be a final plat process that, that follows this. Great. From a uh, skyline standpoint, did you want to add to that too, Eric? Sorry if you got up to. Yeah, I mean it's it's a good question and one that uh, I had to learn after school, and I'm it's fair, you know. The, so what I explain to people on the plat is like if you go to buy a property, if I want to buy a lot one in some subdivision, for example, the plat is actually the document that defines what you're buying, you know. And so then, as as Jeremy said, you know, you have a process to go through and say, okay, let's make sure it all looks good, just like you would on the development plan. That's what the preliminary, preliminary plat is. It's just a, a first look before you go to the final one. And so once it's done, then um, that's what sets the property. That's what defines it. And if you're going to buy or sell it, that's what you're using to, to define it. So from a skyline standpoint, it, I believe that Elk River is one of the public vantage points that counts for that. Is that correct? That is correct. That was all I had. Any other questions? Is there any public? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, the minimum uh, developable site. Are you saying that the four acres is smaller than our minimum lot size for the for the it, zone district? It it is based. It's a the four point two acres does not meet the minimum developable lot for the industrial zone or developable area on a lot for the industrial zone. Um, it's a, yeah, so the the lot itself meets the standard. In fact, we don't have a minimum for the industrial size, but then we say you have to, when you plat, you have to have a minimum like portion of that that can be developed. In this case, they don't meet that standard. Um, just because of how the the equation sort of works out. We'd say the minimum contiguous usable lot area, how we calculate it is 60% times the entire lot. In this case, that would be 7.1 acres. So for us to accept the plat, our standard says you need 7.1 acres to be developable. In this case, only 4.2 of those acres are developable because of the topography. So it's the overall size of the lot that's creating a very large minimum buildable lot size, not that that minimum lot si buildable size is really too small. Yeah, exactly. We don't want, we don't want all that wasted space basically is. We're, yeah, we're saying. trying to force people into, yeah, configuring and developing lots that have a high percentage of buildability. Um, in here and that's sort of why i address this idea that we did meet with the applicant on a number of occasions to discuss the idea if they broke the lot right down the steep slope and they broke it into two parcels they would have stood a different chance of having the preliminary plat accepted but we didn't like the idea of platting a lot that was not accessible that's also against our code so, but that would have gotten them to the minimum developable lot calculation. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there any public comments on this agenda item? Seeing none, is there any online? Seeing none there as well. Is there any final comments from the applicant? No, but thank you for your time. Anything else from staff? Uh, no further comments. We'll close public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. 
I move to approve PL 2022-0407 with one uh, condition of approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, yeah, for me, I mean, the minimum lot developable lot size seems to be a tech, technicality. And also looking at one of the conditions of approval for the request is that it should be, you know, compatible with the character of the existing surrounding properties. And when you look to the front, when there's all these smaller commercially zoned properties, I don't see lot size being a problem at all. Any other discussion? Yeah, I agree. I, I think that the applicant and staff have gone through a really um, well put together project on that. Uh, I do think it is better than the lot splitting. Certainly, that seems like a potential avenue in the future if things changed. But but this for right now makes a lot of sense. And the uh, just the likelihood of the upper portion that is not only skylined, but has the airport easement uh, being developable, I think is so minute that I think this just makes sense as is without causing any kind of special consideration. So I'll be supporting it as well. Any other discussion? Then I'll call the question. Yes. 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 And the motion passes unanimously. Thanks very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. All right, agenda item number three this evening, still public, recommend, uh, public hearings for recommendation to council is PL 2021-0125. This is 863 Broad Street. Is the applicant here for a presentation? Welcome back. Are we ready to go? Let's see. I'm gonna to try to zoom in here uh, and share my screen and do my presentation that way, so. I was muted in the back. That was my echo. I couldn't control it. You got a good All microphone right. on that thing. <laughs> good evening, Planning Commission. Walter McGill, Four Points Surveying and Engineering. And tonight we're here to present a uh, final plat with a major variance for 863 Broad Street. 863 is located right here. I highlighting on it. It's a uh, there's currently a house built about 1950 here on the east side and a cottage built about 1965 on the west side. The lots in here are not shown, but the lots are running east-west, 25 feet long. This property is across five lots. And this property, the original applicant was the uh, fellow named Jim Hansen who lived in town and sold the property. So the new purchaser is making the application. So there was a little bit of trouble getting the correct application in there on the property record card that we've resolved with staff. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and you know where the property is. Some of the issues that were talked about uh, were, if you look at the whole neighborhood, you can see there's some lots up here on Arapaho Lane, and this is Deerfoot as well, 98 and 94, which face south, 99 comes off south, and then there's several properties that run east-west as the plat on Broad Street. We talked a little bit about sidewalk became an issue, but then was taken off the board by city staff. This upper portion of Broad Street is about 12 or 13%. There's well-established trees up in this north corner, as well as between the properties. This one more moment. I should have this. Share screen. Okay, thanks. All right, more rolling. This is basically a summary of the plan set. Uh, this is the existing conditions. Uh, and what we have, as I said, there's the lots were platted east-west direction, so each of these lots. And when staff first took a look at this, they really wanted us to uh, subdivide at about a midpoint here. So 125 would be 62 and a half because we're asking for a variance tonight, and I'll show on the plat, for the maximum lot width in an RO district. 
But the way these homes were situated, they were situated far enough apart, both the existing structure and the rental cottage in the side, that a lot line going down through the north-south, which is on my page here, is what's proposed for the site plan. So this has the lots being subdivided in the north-south direction, which therefore allows uh, to maintain the yard and the trees that are up on the easterly lot we propose. We still feel that the access to the east lot will still come from Broad Street, and it's proposed that the new lot on the west side will come down the alley, be an improved alley here, which has currently been their driveway, and allow for a home in this adjacent lot to the west. Um, they'll have, they have already established a new sewer. They had to revise the sewer because it was going under the building to the west, and that's been accomplished last winter. Uh, the water will be corrected as well to have individual water services. So we had the variance for the maximum lot width, and really the hardship was kind of the existing houses and what's been established here is the biggest part of that hardship that's we really request that. We don't think it's a negative impact to the neighborhood as well as it preserves some mature trees in Old Town up in this corner. If we had a north lot, then that access would have to either come from too close to the intersection of Broad Street or the back alley, but really kind of push that house into that corner as well as have to remove this existing house because it no longer would be with a uh, five foot setback in RO. And so, uh, I think we've worked well with staff and this is a, a bit of an infill project that can accommodate a secondary unit on even on the westerly lot. So I think it meets some of the goals of the community plan. The final plot of itself, we do have just over the minimum, we're about 6,000. Uh, I want that there, maybe I can zoom these. Our lot on the west side is 6,021 feet, and on the east side, it's 9,594 square feet. Uh, that's the basic presentation for tonight's subdivision of this existing property, which maintains two existing structures and allows them to subdivide and possibly redevelop in the future. All right, thanks. Okay. Does staff have a presentation as well? Yeah, I'll just add a little bit. Toby Stauffer, senior planner. Um, as Walter mentioned, this is a subdivision to divide this property into two lots with one structure on each lot um, with a major variance to maximum lot width. The, um, the properties surrounding this property um, to the south are, um, or to the west, I suppose, below the property are zoned RO. To the north are zoned RN3, so different zoning with slightly different dimensional standards and lot sizes. Um, the existing structures will remain and they'll meet the principal building setbacks with the exception of one addition to um, the structure on lot one, which will need to be removed before the plat is recorded. Um, the 125 foot lot width is um, original with the Deerfoot addition subdivision. It wasn't created by this property. So both the Deerfoot Avenue frontage and the Broad Street frontage have 125 foot widths. Um, we do find that this subdivision would be compatible with lots in the area. Lots to the north across Deerfoot have a north-south orientation. Um, lots to the south have an east-west orientation. Um, Deerfoot Avenue seems to be a natural transition from a north-south orientation to an east-west orientation. There are four similar lots that front on Deerfoot Avenue um, that have the potential to redevelop and may likely redevelop in a north-south orientation. Um, the proposed lots have existing access points that are developed, so we don't anticipate any adverse impacts from the orientation or any future development if these lots were to be redeveloped with different housing. Um, we find that the plat meets the preliminary plat criteria, and in regard to the variance, um, we find that the purpose and intent of the code standard will not be achieved by strict application of the standard in this circumstance. The purpose of the RO dimensional standard is to allow for infill and subdivision of oversized lots that results in the same general shape and size to be consistent in character with those around them. As we've mentioned, the condition to the lot width is existing. Um, it's not being created by the subdivision. 
The Deerfoot front edge is non-conforming and will be conforming after this subdivision. And again, the Broad Street lot width is existing and consistent with the surrounding area. So we find that the proposed lot shapes and size are compatible with others in the area and that the purpose of the standard is still achieved. So with that, uh, we recommend support of this project with the three conditions as listed. Right, thank you very much. Questions from commissioners? For the applicant, uh, did I hear you say that the newly created lot was gonna be accessed off the alley and not off a of deer foot? And I, if that's correct, I would ask why. That is correct. That's a kind of a downtown standard and considering old town, still Deerfoot as downtown, that access would be taken off the alley to avoid additional, additional intersections along Deerfoot Avenue. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, the current, so there's two, two buildings on there currently, is one a secondary unit to the other or are those just long-standing non-conforming both primary residences? One is a secondary unit to the larger. So one is a primary residence and the other is a secondary unit. The secondary unit has a small addition on it, which um, has not been found to be legally conforming. So that addition will need to be removed. And that's the one that you referenced earlier when you were saying something needed to be. Yeah. Thank you. There's, there's a pretty visible addition to the one structure. So the, the secondary unit could potentially remain intact with the addition removed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And then uh, my other question, uh, maybe for the applicant, with the um, the separation um, drawn the way that it is, it looks like it's running parallel to the larger building and that the smaller building is, if only they had been a few inches further away from each other, they would have actually met the new setback layouts. Does this create a legal non-conforming situation or how is that being addressed? You know, in fact, they do meet the side setbacks in RO between the two buildings. Okay. And so that was one of the- It doesn't seem to in the line graphics on the plan set. Is that right? They appear to encroach, but that may be a different issue altogether. Uh, it's great if they if they do. I, I'm just uh, worried that if they don't, and then somebody wants to add on to this building in the future, and then it's found that it's- Northeast court illegally non-conforming or something uh, that would that would be a bummer so I, I didn't know and, and maybe staff could weigh in as well but yeah so you and I you and I didn't really discuss that too much and don't know if we want to when we looked at the um the legal non-conforming registration for that um secondary unit we did find that that the secondary unit the larger rectangle of the smaller house is um, legally non-conforming. So that would be a legally non-conforming setback. The lot line could be shifted a bit, but it, um, I think it's an existing non-conforming situation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. North Northeast corner kind of within the red bubble that yeah. somebody put on there. The, the location of the structure is legally non-conforming with yeah. where it is. Um, Just kind of as this gets subdivided, that gets kind of yeah. presumed, I guess, is maybe the word that that's now legally non-conforming into that setback. Yeah, it does appear to encroach um, a few inches into that. We're setback. talking so minor that I, I wanted to even just ignore it, but I just want to make sure that the T's were crossed on on that process. But so you think that it is that that it will have good like, legal standing? Yeah, the, if they were to, it would be an additional um, variance request to change the setback standards that could be processed with this application would be one way to address that setback standard or that um, property would just be considered um, further non-conforming. We try not to increase non-conformities with the subdivision. So it does appear that this is um, encroaching a, a few small inches um, into that setback, into the proposed setback. When it's so, yeah, please. Can I ask a question of the applicant um, to address that? Um, would would it be possible to adjust that new lot line slightly to ensure that that building is not encroaching into the new setback that's created by that new lot line? Yeah. I, and we could address that with a condition of approval that it be 
adjusted prior to recording, you know, with on the final plot prior to recording? Yes, we can easily do that. I'd, I'd like to check that dimension again, both directions, because we could put an angle there halfway down uh, between the buildings and we could put an angle there by where uh, across from my screen here, but we have an L6 on that site plan to just change that bearing if it's just a few seconds or if it's a minute of degree, and then that would increase the square footage, but we'll revise that. So it, so we're not into this issue. Yeah, correct. Because I don't think we can call that legal yep. non-conforming. We're creating a new lot line. So yes. that setback is yep. new. Yep. That sounds great. I, I was thinking a condition could be added tonight that just says that that encroachment is okay. But if that creates too many headaches, then no, you this, this sounds a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Put an angle on it. Any other questions? Is there any public comment for this agenda item? So please come down, state your name and address, and keep your comments at three minutes. I'm C.K. Erickson. <clears throat> I live at 99 Deerfoot Avenue, which is the lots to the west of this proposal. A major question is, what are they going to do for snow storage? Right now, they're trying to push the snow into my property. They have no place to put it. By making it two lots, you're going to just aggravate that because it's not going to be able to go back out onto Broad Street because right now access for the little unit is off of Deerfoot Avenue. <clears throat> they come in off at Deerfoot down the alley to it. So they have to plow all that snow someplace and there is no place left to store it. So I would be opposed to this uh, setup unless I can come up with adequate snow storage or a means of um, hauling the snow off. Any questions? We only we can only really do it as public comment, but thank you for those comments. Okay. Is there any additional public comment? Seeing none, is there any public comment online for this agenda item? <clears throat> seen none there either uh i will come back to final follow-up um is there any final comments from the applicant or from staff uh, the only thing i would mention regarding snow storage is um when we look at the subdivision we make sure that the property has enough area to meet the zone district requirements. And we anticipate that that minimum lot size and area should accommodate adequate snow storage. Our, um, our regulations do require property owners to store snow on their own property. So they have to clear their driveway that's in the alley and put their snow on their property and any other snow that they need to place there. So um, it sounds like they will need to um, change their management of their snow and keep their own um, snow on their property. We can enforce that um, through the city on occasion. Um, I heard the other day that we do that with our police and we're currently short staffed on our police. So we, have, we haven't been able to do much enforcement on snow storage or snow clearing this year, but um, we would anticipate that those both those lots would need to store their snow adequately on their own property. Thank you, that helps that understanding. Not a good year for not being able to enforce snow storage. Any final questions from commissioners? I'll close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I should note that I did write down the condition that you all wanted to talk about um, was that we would adjust the proposed lot line between lots one and two to confirm that both lots are conforming with the proposed setbacks prior to the final plat. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to make a motion or discuss? Uh, hypothetically, if you can't get this lot line adjusted, what then? I mean, it looks like there might be enough space to, to pinch it in, but. They would likely have to include another variance request. So we would have to um, have this hearing again and table the city council hearing to, to review that variance request that they would have to add. When it's a subdivision, does that count as a minor adjustment or would it have to be a full variance? Um, it doesn't matter whether it's minor or major. Oh. Um, it would just need to be considered with this preliminary plat process. So, okay. 
Anybody want to make a motion? I'll move to approve 2021-0125 with the three listed conditions and the fourth condition as described by Toby Stauffer. I'll second, second that. Motion in some seconds. Any other discussion? No, they, because of the existing lots are already beyond the, uh, the zone district recommendation for maximum width. I don't think we're creating anything new. And I don't think that's a real variance to be concerned about. I agree. I think this gets us one step closer to the vision of the RO district. It's taking a larger lot, making it into two smaller lots, providing a little bit of infill, even though there's already two houses on there. It might not provide the opportunity for uh, some secondary units and you know maybe some workforce housing in that situation. Agree. I'll just add that I, I like that it's preserving what's there as much as possible. While we could have found, a, you know, as the, the drawings had that other option that cuts through half of both buildings in order to make them legal, how is that seen as a more successful solution? So I, I think this makes a lot of sense as well. I agree. Great. I'll call the question. Yes. 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 And that motion passes unanimously. Which brings us to agenda item number four, PL 2022-0425. This is 2510 Copper Ridge Drive. It's the applicant here for a presentation. Good evening, Planning Commission. Walter McGill, Four Points Surveying and Engineering. Uh, Ryan, the owner of Conroy Moving, is online as well, uh, but I'll be presenting the project tonight. So. Tonight's project, let me share my screen, see how easily this goes. The project you're looking at tonight is an expansion for the existing Conroy Moving. Conroy Moving is here at 2510 Copper Ridge Drive, and they've existed with the Conroy Moving building here since 1997. Ryan Shorter is the owner of Conroy Moving, and he's proposing tonight to do an addition of 6,000 square foot onto this lot of lot 10 Copper Ridge, in addition to doing self-storage. So 8,800 square foot of self-storage in 22 different units. Um, so this comes with one variance tonight to a water body setback. So I'm gonna close this screen and put up the plan set. Okay, thanks. Uh, as I said, civil development plans for Copper Ridge Village Business Park. Uh, the existing, and so we're gonna get into here. Here is the site plan. So what we're proposing now, the property has been turned 90 degrees, so north is to my left, up the screen towards this side of the building. Proposing a 6,000 square foot new building here to the additional for storage and loading of materials during the moving business. On the other side of the parking lot, the entire interior area will become pavement with parking and we would have self-contained self-storage units on the south side of the lot here. Uh, we have additional parking stalls being installed as well as a drainage area, a dumpster enclosure, uh, the drainage will go against this 40 foot drainage easement that was done as part of the Copper Ridge subdivision, 40 foot wide drainage easement in here. The new building will be 40 and a half feet from that. So it's gonna be six inches from there. And we're proposing a 10 foot water body setback versus a 30 foot water body setback. Now the understanding here, where did the 30 foot water body setback because it's not on the plat. Well, the 30 foot water body setback becomes because this drainage area is greater than 20 acres. So any drainage greater than 20 acres requires, the new code requires a 30 foot 
drainage setback. However, the building, you know, this is kind of now we're in the code from 2017. I'm not sure if this became code in 2017 or 2015, but it hasn't been code for other developments within Copper Ridge. Um, so we went through some engineering design and we've calculated here to put in both a culvert and then an overflow glass grass line swale for snow melt treatment, as well as so that would preserve water from debris that's coming off here from snow storage and things like that. So we'll improve the drainage with some uh, turf reinforcement here, and then as well as this culvert and it's on its way out to come down. This water here on the interior off the parking lot will go through the sand filter and through a type C inlet and be treated for secondary treatment that way. Uh, staff was in support of the drainage setback variance in this case, uh, because of consistency with the neighborhood around here, as well as establishment that this drainage area, not all drainage areas are created equal. And the endangerment here, there hasn't been any flooding in this area. There's a lot of water that comes off of game trails in different area that I've seen around Copper Ridge. Um, and, but I think that this will, will be accommodated by both the culvert, the grass line swale and the improvements to the existing ditch. This project does come through with putting sidewalk on one side of Copper Ridge. Now, I did speak in public comment about Copper Ridge. The sidewalk master plan really calls for sidewalks on the other side of the road, not on this side of the road at Copper Ridge Circle, but uh, the owner has agreed to put the sidewalk in here, so I won't say anything more, but there's not sidewalks on either side here. And there's also not access from the sidewalk to the street. so but the sidewalk will go in to conform with plan. Uh, we're also reducing the width of the access, excuse me about that. The access is too wide, what's currently platted here. So it needs to be reduced for 32 feet is the maximum allowable width there. So you can see some areas here where the asphalt's coming out. Um, there's some drainage access easements, the conditions of approval, so that gives City staff, a legal right to come in here and work on this drainage if they need. And then you also have the standard navigation easement and Toby will speak to what the other easement is there for nearby airport facilities. Uh, see if I put anything else in here. Utilities are an extension. We've got kind of a concrete drain pan in here to help with the drainage. Uh, this is a profile of some drainage infrastructure. So, uh, that's all I have for tonight. If you have any questions, I'll be here for additional questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Is staff ready for a presentation as well? Sure. Toby Stauffer, senior planner. Um, as Walter said, this is a request to build a 6,000 square foot warehouse expansion um, to an existing warehouse building and add 22 new self storage units um, with a water body setback variance. The property is owned industrial. Um, it is currently developed. It's adjacent to open space that was dedicated with the Copper Ridge Business Park. Um, and there is an existing drainage on the property within a, an existing 40 foot drainage that conveys drainage from this property and surrounding properties. Um, self storage is a conditional use in the industrial zone district. Uh, warehouse is a use by right. And the water body request as Walter mentioned is to be 10 feet from the water body for the new buildings instead of the required 30 feet uh, there will be a new trash enclosure, landscaping, parking, drainage, and water quality facilities, and a new sidewalk with this site development. Um, we find that the conditional use is consistent and compatible with the existing uses in the area and the future land use plan for the area, which calls for it to be industrial. Um, we find that the development plan meets the criteria for approval as well, um, with the exception of the water body setback variance. Um, Regarding that, we find that the special circumstances for the water body setback variants are that there is an existing 40 foot wide drainage easement. The easement was created at the time of subdivision um, to accommodate that existing drainage and the, the existing plat and drainage easement and all of its infrastructure was created before the current 30 foot water body setback requirement. So strict application of the standard would require um, a water body setback within an easement, which may not be necessary in the circumstance. Um, 
We do find that this is suitable for additional industrial development and infill and shouldn't um, impact any adjacent properties um, or um, impact any um, rights or privileges of those properties. Um, we do find that the development is creating some water quality of the water and the drainage on this site. Um, water quality has, our drainage off the site hasn't been treated prior to this. And so this will treat some of the drainage from the rest of Copper Ridge and um, the drainage from this current site and the proposed impacts. So we find that to be a positive and consistent with the purpose of the water body setback, which um, does include um, enhancing the quality of water resources and improving water quality. So uh, with that, we are recommending approval of this project with the 11 conditions as listed. Great, thank you very much. Questions from commissioners? What's the risk of not having the 30 foot setback? I think um, one risk could be that there is not adequate drainage flow um, in high, high volume storms or years, um, or that there is not adequate water quality. Um, I think those are some of the purposes of our water body setback. Um, again, this water body is already within a 40 foot drainage easement, which does provide some um, buffer to that water and some water quality. So um, adding 30 feet into this um, would have a 20 foot impact into their, into their building. They would have to lose a little bit of um, warehouse expansion space and um, maybe a unit or two of self storage. Well, is this, um, is this like a dry swale? Yeah, it doesn't run water actively. There's two properties to the north that are actually closer than this uh, on the easement. So there's some condominiums. It does run water, it will run water in the spring, the spring certainly, and then it dries up in the summer. So I guess it's more than seasonal than dry. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, that, this for Walter as well on the drainage. Uh, so you're making drainage improvements to stabilize the slopes and allow for water quality treatment. Correct. We have both the culvert and then on top of the culvert, we have a grass line swale. Right. And then we're going to put down some turf matting for reinforcement. Okay, which is an improvement from what's there. Uh, for staff on the sidewalk issue, um, I mean, are, is the city better served to have payment in lieu of versus uh, a sidewalk to nowhere and from nowhere? We offer an option of um, alternative compliance, which is a fee in lieu of for the sidewalk. Um, so every property owner can choose to build the proper, build the sidewalk on their property or pay a fee in lieu or build it elsewhere. So those are options. Um, this, this developer chose to, um, to build that sidewalk. Uh, we, it's hard to say, but we might've supported a, a fee in lieu if they had wanted to do that here. But um, we do believe that the area Copper Ridge itself um, does need sidewalks. We've uh, revisited that. Um, it is part of our sidewalk master plan. There is a fair number of work live over there and lots of people that are there consistently. Um, we are building sidewalks in the area. There was some recent sidewalks built there. So um, we will fill that in someday. So it won't be a sidewalk to nowhere for forever. To be on the other side of the road. It may jump back and forth in that subdivision. It's hard to say, um, but I think there there's a lot of existing conditions and existing development. We did actually walk um, the Copper Ridge subdivision earlier this summer to sort of evaluate the sidewalk necessity and, and needs out there. So with the conditions, there's some pretty steep um, open space lots within Copper Ridge that the city would likely have to develop sidewalk on. So we may end up jumping across the street anyway. That's a condition that happens through a lot of our community. So it's still better to have a sidewalk on one side than no sidewalks. Thanks. Would the applicant have preferred to do a fee in lieu or uh, Toby kind of alluded to the fact that you got a chosen and I see that it's drawn, but. Well, here's what happens in fee in lieu of, uh, you've, yeah, you have to design the sidewalk and then you have to get bids on the sidewalk, go through the bids back with engineering and work out a price. And engineering is looking at, well, what did we pay for sidewalks last year? 
And not all sidewalks are created equal. Some cost more along Casey's Pond, a CDOT standard than what they might cost out here. So what you end up with in my mind is a lot of different contractors can say self-performance. Well, Ryan might know someone that can do some grading for him. He might have a skid steer so he can grade it. And then he can get somebody with some extra concrete to pour it intermittently and he can get it cheaper. Uh, met with a client last night that was paying on Copper Ridge, you know, $22,000 fee and lieu of for a small piece of sidewalk. And so I think the price that the city wants for fee and lieu of a lot of times doesn't meet the market price. And in my mind, we should kind of establish it and then move it inflationary and not have to do the design and just be able to quickly pay it all in the fee, very simplified. And so then it's more of an enticement. I mean, we'd all rather see sidewalks on Tamarack, Hilltop, Amethyst, let's take a pick, than another sidewalk going here. But the applicants are in this road where, well, your fee and lieu is way up here, I can self-perform. I think for the betterment of everybody is my push. And I'll be back here with three other, you know, Copper Ridge developments that are going to bring the same issues. So we staff's listening. I heard staff too, but it's going to become for planning commission and city council because I'm not going to have support from staff on some of these changes that I'm proposing on these lots. But I want to help more people with more sidewalks. And it doesn't seem right doing this at Copper Ridge where people are in, out, across the street and back and forth when we have the same issues that we have up on Tamarack. So the applicant said I can get it. I can do it cheaper than fee and of. So. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, for staff, Toby, you shared with me, uh, I think it was a drainage and drainage plan. And is it fair to say that this water body mainly was, I don't know if it's created or natural, but its main purpose is to drain the existing Copper Ridge development area, not scratch the knot. Its main purpose is to capture runoff from the, the developed area. Yeah, yeah. The um, the that drainage map that I did share, I think with you and the rest of the planning commission came from the drainage study. It shows um, a fairly large watershed that goes up and over the hills. Um, so it does drain a lot of this Copper Ridge development um, surrounding lots that are developed, surrounding lots that are not developed and uh, this property. So the, the drainage does, um, as Walter said, I think it does flow in this in the springtime and it is, um, whether it's man-made or not, it's, it's um, persisted over time. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Is there any, uh, now there's no public, is there any public comment online for this agenda item? No, I've seen none. Does she have any final follow up, Walter? Or Toby? Nope. Final questions from commissioners? I'll close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. Oh, I, I'll, I mean, I, I'm supportive of this. I'm glad the drainage improvements are there. I'm uh, always confused about the sidewalk issue, um, but it is what it is in this case, and it's obviously cheaper to put a sidewalk to nowhere. Um, but that said, uh, I'll motion to approve uh, PL 2022-0425 with all uh, stated conditions. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? I think it was brought up during discussion that the fact that the applicant is doing improvements to the water body and the uh, collection and screening of the, the runoff, I think, is a valuable improvement. And the fact that the buildings immediately upstream are already encroaching, that the new encroachment is of minimal impact. Uh, Again, it's we're also approving a variance for uh, self-storage units, which are conditional use in the industrial zone district. Again, I have no information at this time that says they are inappropriate yet. So I'm okay with that as well. There was a thir third item that we're approving. Uh, conditional use development plan, water body variance. That's it. Should be it. Any other comments, discussion? I'll agree with you guys. Um, I think the fact that this is called a water body setback variance is why we need to update our water body setback variances or setback standards in general. This is a, I think this is a great solution for what the applicant is having to deal with with the current code. And I'd like to see the code updated to change. 
um, and make that a little bit simpler um, when looking at these type of seasonal drainages um, as they are. As far as this, the sidewalk, um, I appreciate the applicant's explanation as to why he is showing one. And I know that he's meeting the code standard. I find these patchwork sidewalks more dangerous than helpful when you have to get on and off them. Uh, I would like to see the city putting together a, a Put together a better understanding of of kind of costs and how the fee and loop works for the different uh, um, neighborhoods, so that a sidewalk can literally be produced and made safe all at once, as opposed to this patchwork that may or may not ever serve anything with with no guarantee. Um, I would have liked to have seen somehow a conversation that that led to a that led to a better solution than this, but I understand again that this is kind of what fits the engineering criterion. And so it's easily acceptable, but it doesn't seem very ideal. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I had to add. Unless there's any other discussion, then I will call the question. Yes. 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 And that passed unanimously as well. Thanks for your time. Look. Do we have a director's report this evening? I do not. Okay. And we had no meeting minutes. That's it for us tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we're adjourned.